чьи образы встают перед глазами, когда в День Победы мы вспоминаем союзников по антигитлеровской коалиции? Рузвельт, Черчилль и стоящие за их спинами американские и британские генералы на Ялтинской конференции. Еще французы, двухметровый генерал де Голли эскадрилья Нормандия Неман. И поляки на танке рыжий с храбрым псом Шариком. Но кроме них на фронтах величайшей в мире войны сражались солдаты десятков стран мира. Приближая победу над врагом, они дрались и умирали точно так же, как бойцы многомиллионных армий великих держав. Поэтому они заслуживают, чтобы о них рассказали. This is Cuba, a fine, jovial nation, once close to Russia. We have, alas, nearly forgotten about it. Yet, our good comrades live there, whose friendship is worthy. They are a stubborn folk, courageous and independent. Cuba entered World War II after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 8, 1941. But the Cubans had been assisting the USSR for six months already. More than 100 committees to help the USSR had been set up there. They collected over 100 tons of coffee and tobacco and 40,000 bags of sugar. America's Sugar Bowl, so Cuba was dubbed in the war years, Cuba stopped sending sugar to Germany and now supplied it only to the US. Alcohol was made from it and used for explosives. It and high octane fuel were among the first lend-lease items for the USSR. Cuban manganese was part of the American armor supplied to the Red Army. The 12,700 imported tanks were a serious complement to our T-34 tank forces. These deliveries crossed the ocean, but the Caribbean was teeming with German submarines. The Cuban Navy escorted over 400 convoys of the Allies more than once, they helped the Americans repel German subs' torpedo attacks. A Cuban patrol boat destroyed one sub with depth charges on May 15, 1943, vengeance for a Cuban transport sunk two days earlier. The Cuban Air Force gave escort to over 100 Allied transports over the war. Even the famous writer Ernest Hemingway hunted German subs. On a boat, he and an armed crew drove at least one submarine from the coastline. Hundreds of Cubans fought for the Allies, three of them on the Eastern Front. Aldo Vivo Loran served in an infantry division at Leningrad and died in December 1944 on the Nevsky Pitachok. He was awarded posthumous decorations. His younger brother, Jorge Vivo Loran, also fought with partisans at Leningrad. Lieutenant Enrique Villar Figueredo from Manzanillo was a Red Army officer. He fell on January 30th, 1945, when his platoon took the German town of Furstenau. For his heroism, he was posthumously decorated. Cuban volunteers fought in the Allies' armies, too. Bomber pilot Miguel Enciso was a distinguished example. He received decorations from the UK, France, and Canada. He flew with 300 British bombers attacking the German city of Kiel, where they sunk the Admiral Scheer while still in port. The Cubans were sure 
that their Miguel landed the fatal blow on the Cher. During the war, the Soviet people were very popular with the Cubans. The Russians were seen as independent-minded and freedom-loving. Gifts flooded the USSR from 1943. The Havana Rotary Club sent Red Army fighters myriad boxes of rum and cigarettes. The same ship carried donated x-ray machines and microscopes. This laid the foundation of later Cuban-Russian friendship. Unlike Cuba, Mexico did not declare war on the Axis after Pearl Harbor. Yet, as the Mexicans say, our country is too far from God and too close to the USA. Soon, Mexico became a branch of US industry, especially defense. Half a million Mexicans worked directly for the USA, and they all knew who the weapons were meant for. Mexican oil supplied to the USA was turned into gasoline, including the fuel bound for the USSR under Lend-Lease. German submarines sank five tanker ships in 1942 to disrupt supplies, and then carried on their hunt in the Caribbean. On May 13th, a German sub sank another Mexican tanker. 14 sailors died. This was the straw that broke the camel's back. President Camacho declared war on Hitler's gang. The Mexican Navy and Air Force began hunting Nazi submarines. On July 4, 1942, in the Gulf of Mexico, a German U-129 sub torpedoed the Soviet tanker Tuapse. Sailors ran for the lifeboats, expecting certain death. But this time, it was the Germans who had to save themselves when a Coast Guard plane appeared overhead. I saw waves coming from the submerged submarine, so I dropped depth charges, said Major Noriega Medrano. The Nazi predators fled, and the Soviet sailors made it out alive though they never learned the name of their savior. The Aztec Eagles squadron flew with the Yanks and hit Japanese positions in the Philippines and Taiwan. They made some 800 sorties. Though seven pilots lost their lives, the rest returned to a hero's welcome. Around 15,000 Mexicans volunteered for the U.S. Army. 10% of them were killed or wounded. In August 1942, Brazil, South America's largest nation, began to collaborate with the anti-Nazi coalition, but only after ensuring major U.S. investment in its industry. Only through Lend-Lease did Brazil's army get weapons and materiel, some $400 million worth. The expanse was justified. Brazil supplied the U.S. with iron, manganese, aluminum, chrome, and tungsten ores, plus rubber and other raw materials to make tires. Much of this went into the materiel supplied to the USSR. The Americans got the right to base planes on Brazil's coast. This helped to better fight the German subs. In response, the Germans began to sink Brazilian merchant vessels, 36 altogether. Over 2,000 men died. Brazil erupted with outrage at the sinking of civilian ships and deaths. The country was led to declare war on Germany and Italy. Politicians and the public would not let this blow to their honor go unpunished. 
the German embassy in Rio de Janeiro was closed, its staff, along with the other Italian diplomats, interred. Shops owned by their citizens were closed and kept guarded. Their goods were confiscated. Now the friendship between Roosevelt and Brazil's President Vargas became an alliance. Brazil's Air Force and Navy covered shipping convoys and attacked German subs. The Americans sank nine of them. On July 31, 1943, Brazilian pilots destroyed two more with depth charges. In total, the Brazilians led over 600 convoys for the Allied forces fighting in Italy. In 1944, they were joined by the Brazilian Expeditionary Force, a whole 25,000 infantry and Air Force soldiers. Their sleeve patch showed a snake smoking after the popular saying, more likely a snake would smoke a pipe, than the FEB go to the front and fight. Their version of when pigs fly. Now the pigs were flying in earnest. In April 1945, the smoking snakes liberated Turin in Italy, taking many prisoners. Back home, scouts Orlando de Silva, Geraldo da Cruz, and Geraldo de Souza were especially honored. They refused to surrender when surrounded. After they used their last ammo, they charged with bayonets. The Germans were surprised at such courage. After burying the slain men, they left a cross inscribed, Three Brave Brazilians. In eight months of fighting, the Brazilians lost 2,000 soldiers and sailors, three warships, 22 planes, and 25 cargo ships. Among the most heroic of our little allies was one which saw total war. New Zealand, alone among the British dominions, declared war on the entire Axis on September 3rd, 1939, including their satellites, even exotic Thailand. With a population then of just 1.6 million, New Zealand sent nearly 200,000 men overseas. This small island nation, where the enemy never set foot, lost about 1% of its population in World War II. The New Zealanders were also among the first to fight. On December 13, 1939, Three months after they had declared war, the New Zealand cruiser Achilles and two British ships attacked the German Admiral Graf Spee. This went down in history as the Battle of the River Plate. The Admiral Graf Spee was Hitler's pride and joy. Experts called it the world's finest cruiser. Three years before, Hitler had appointed it his flagship at a Kriegsmarine parade. Since the war's outbreak, it had sunk 11 British transports. Now came this battle off Uruguay's coast, two British ships and a New Zealand one versus the German supercruiser. All the ships suffered damage with the British flagship done in for good. The other two light cruisers forced the German ship to retreat and lay anchor. When one more Allied cruiser arrived, the Admiral Graf Spee's commander blew up his ship at Hitler's personal order and shot himself. New Zealand sent an infantry division to Europe. It fought in Greece and on Crete then distinguished itself in North Africa. After British troops were defeated in Libya in June 1942, it was New Zealand soldiers with Austrians and South Africans who stopped the Germans at El Alamein. 
preventing them from reaching the Suez Canal. It was through Suez that USSR-bound supplies passed. Give me the Maori Battalion and I will conquer the world, said the Germans' General Rommel, the so-called Desert Fox. The Maori are the indigenous people of New Zealand. These exotic shots show a celebration, Maori soldiers homecoming. It started with a solemn ceremony to award the Victoria Cross to parents of a fallen Maori officer. The 28th Maori Battalion was founded in 1940 under the New Zealand Expeditionary Force. The brave indigenous battalion lost 20% of its men. All the fallen heroes were remembered at a joint feast. The traditionally cooked meat would be enough for all. The Russians too enjoyed New Zealand mutton. Tens of thousands of butchered sheep and bales of wool came through Lend-Lease. So many Soviet soldiers were kept warm by high-quality New Zealand merino wool coats. The second New Zealand division under the British defeated the Germans in Libya and Tunisia, then landed in Italy at war's end and liberated Padua and Trieste. The third New Zealand infantry division, with the Americans, liberated the Solomon Islands and the New Britain Islands from the Japanese. New Zealanders even made it to the Russian Arctic. August 28, 1941, saw already the first pilots arrive with hurricane fighter planes. They were British, Australians, and New Zealanders. Sir Neville Ramsbottom Isherwood, New Zealand-born, commanded them. These foreign pilots successfully fought over the Kola Peninsula till late September, and they helped Soviet pilots master the new technology. Then they departed for other fronts. The Soviet government greatly appreciated this aid and help in fighting. After Stalingrad, Ramsbottom Isherwood and other British pilots received the USSR's Order of Lenin. Let's move on now to Africa. This is Ethiopia, also known as Abyssinia, celebrated by Russian poet Gumilov. <laughs> On the eve of Nazi Germany's treacherous invasion of the USSR, Ethiopia defeated Italian dictator Mussolini's troops in May 1941. The next year, Ethiopia signed the Declaration of the United Nations declaring war on Germany and Japan. But let's backtrack a bit. In 1935, the Italian army had invaded Abyssinia. Italy had 500,000 soldiers, 2,000 artillery pieces, 800 armored vehicles. Ethiopia's Emperor Hale Selassie had not a single tank and just 30 old planes against the Italians' 600. However, this ruler roused his people to fight. A year later, at the League of Nations, Emperor Hale Selassie stated, 
We seized tanks with our bare hands. We bore aerial bombardment, but against the poisonous gas, we were powerless. The Italian army entered Addis Ababa on May 5, 1936. Guerrilla warfare erupted in the country. The occupiers responded with mass executions, but the ground was burning under their feet. When Italy entered World War II, Ethiopian partisans immediately joined the British and their allies. The Italians were defeated, and on May 5, 1941, the fifth anniversary of the fall of Addis Ababa, Hale Selassie entered his liberated capital. On April 23, 1943, Ethiopia and the USSR established diplomatic relations. As a token of his esteem, Hale Selassie sent a symbolic golden shield to Stalingrad. Another symbol of courage, the Stalingrad sword, came from King George VI of Britain, and Lend-Lease brought a present of 1,500 Valentine tanks. The Canadian government threw in another 1,000. One of Germany's greatest foes in the British Commonwealth was Canada. Canadian shipping convoys supplied the UK with weapons, materiel, and foodstuffs. Here, wheat is loaded into a cargo hold in Quebec. Here, potatoes are being brought on board. These are Valentine tanks bound for Russia. From Canada, Lend-Lease brought the Red Army 2,000 armored vehicles, 2,500 trucks, and other military equipment. Canada also provided Air Force training. In World War II, 170,000 Commonwealth Air Force personnel were trained here, including 50,000 pilots. Over half were Canadians. They fought alongside the British, including in the bombing of Berlin. D-Day, June 6, 1944, saw the opening of a second front. The Canadian army landed in France, then helped to liberate Belgium and Holland, and saw out the war in Germany. On May 4, 1945, UK Field Marshal Montgomery accepted German forces surrender in the Netherlands, Denmark, and Northwest Germany. On the night of May 8th, Germany surrendered unconditionally. The war with Germany was over for the Big Three and all their allies, including those who had initially been reluctant to ally themselves. Here we are speaking of Persia, as Iran was then called. Earlier, on September 4th, 1939, Tehran had declared its neutrality, and it maintained this on June 26, 1941, after Germany invaded the USSR. Here we can quote Churchill. An active and numerous German mission had installed itself in Tehran, and German prestige stood high. I was not without some anxiety about embarking on a Persian war, but the arguments for it were compelling. These arguments were Persia's oil fields and also the need to supply the USSR with weapons and materiel. Oil was precious lifeblood in the war. It could not go to the Germans. Iran's railway from the Persian Gulf to the Caspian, Churchill felt, was a key link with Russia. In terms of USSR imported cargo, this route ranked second after the Far East. It was also the safest. 
Churchill again. We welcomed the opportunity of joining hands with the Russians and proposed to them a joint campaign. The Red Army entered Iran from Transcaucasia and Central Asia on August 25, 1941. British forces arrived from Iraq and from the sea on the same day. Operation Countenance lasted some 10 days. In the north, 100 Iranian tanks were no match for the Soviets' 1,000. And our leaflets often did an even better job convincing them than bombing. The British, too, quickly seized the country's south. The Shah abdicated in favor of his son, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. On September 9, 1941, the Iranian government broke off relations with the fascists. In no time, the Allies, led by the Americans, built the Persian Corridor, which supplied 8 million tons of cargo to the USSR. This huge project created jobs for hundreds of thousands of ordinary Iranians. Представители нашего флота руководили отправкой в советские порты материалов и вооружения, доставлявшихся сюда через Персидский залив. В иранских портах еще очень распространен труд амбалов, грузчиков, которые заменяют собой механические транспортеры. Корабль за кораблем включались в конвейер великих перевозок Каспийского моря. Даже парусные рыбацкие киржи мы смело пускались в далекое плавание, нагруженные материалами и военным снаряжением. In Iran, Lend-Lease vehicles were put together from parts. After they were carefully tested, the Studebakers, Dodges and Willys drove 2,000 kilometers to the Soviet border. Narrow mountain roads, baking deserts with sandstorms, bad weather and rebellious tribes some 184,000 vehicles went through all this. As the Allies respected Iran's independence, its government no longer feared colonization. On September 9, 1943, Iran declared war on the Third Reich. Two months later, Iran hosted an international conference. Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill came to discuss the war and the post-war world. The Germans failed to prevent these heads of three states from meeting. The trio confirmed Iran's independence and territorial integrity and promised it large economic aid. In turn, the Shah's sister raised funds for Soviet orphans. Горячими симпатиями у тагеранского населения пользуется Красная Армия. За 9 месяцев жители иранской столицы собрали около 3 миллионов реалов и тысячи посылок для героических советских бойцов. The Supreme Soviet awarded Ashraf Pahlavi the Order of the Red Banner of Labor. It was a remarkable era. The proletariat nation recognized princesses and kings, while those sent it tokens of respect and admiration. Our memory is vast, as is our gratitude. It holds everything. We know that had it not been for the Cubans, Mexicans, Brazilians, Ethiopians, Iranians, Canadians, and New Zealanders, our allies, the war would have gone on for many more hellish years. More of our kinsfolk would have perished, while life away from the front lines 
would have been more arduous. We fought against a common foe, sometimes on different sides of the globe, sometimes shoulder to shoulder. But we fought together, and it proved victorious together. It is one immortal regiment that we share. We all have the right to walk together, not only through Russian cities, but the whole world. You have given us good hope, brothers and sisters. Our fathers and forefathers could stand side by side. That is not only history, that is a covenant. <laughs>